And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Fire in the Head Productions. A man of many talents, and a man who prop who probably has better weather than I do some days, mostly like I did this week. The one and only <laughs> Mike Yo. How you doing? Hello, today, everybody. Well, uh, uh, thanks for having me back to the monastery. Thank you for thank you for being willing to come to come back. I know that once again I just showed up out of nowhere. <laughs> and by the way, it is Yao. By the way, yeah, why Yao. I know that's kind of it's a weird last name. I just got I just got grilled a week ago over my bad Slavic. You'd think I'd learned by now. <laughs> yeah. Are you of Slavic uh, descent by any chance? Because that would be no, really useful. No, but the guest was, and he's do he's doing a Slavic take on D and D fifth edition, and I kept screwing up pronunciation to the point where I threw up my hands and was like, you know what? You need to start making a pronunciation guide and, and put it on YouTube or something. <laughs> yeah, that would I would totally buy that. Or watch it, as the case may be. I haven't checked if he actually did it. And That's a good idea. And given given the popularity of stuff like The Witcher, I think it's something worth at least dipping into. Yeah, and I personally like to run a lot of Romanian, Slavic sort of uh, regions of the Savage Kingdom setting, so I, I, I definitely would eat that stuff up. Mm -hmm. But with the, but getting back getting back to the heart of the matter. So currently you are crowdfunding for a sup a adventure supplement called for Savage Kingdoms called Heroic Adventures, which correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is a bit of a first because back with um second edition, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. You ha and even with first edition, I don't recall you doing a whole lot of adventure module um set expansions yeah you're you're absolutely correct this is the first one uh so this will include four possibly five uh adventure modules within the book and then the uh back of the book will contain contain another bestiary section probably probably 20 to 25 new creatures and npc templates mm -hmm. um actually if you count the npcs it's probably more like 50 to 40 or 50 but but yeah, but the main focus is uh, those four or five adventures, uh, most of which I've already run at like Dragon Con and other conventions, and I've just kind of fleshed them out. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of them I've run for my personal gaming groups, and they were a pretty big hits, so I decided to take the greatest hits of the adventures and uh, publish them into a book. I just thought it'd be kind of so that's cool, a, lot more, a little, a little different writing style. Yeah, sorry. So that's how this that's how these got started. These were adventures that you were running at either cons or the or the local events that you do. Yeah, correct. Yeah, they all started as uh, as adventures. Uh, I think one or two even started as kind of a not fleshed out kind of improv. I do a fair amount of improv when I run games, and as most people do, and sometimes adventure hooks are just kind of this idea, and then they develop. And so it's kind of cool. Is I think at least one of them started as just this idea in my head in the moment and now it's fleshed out which is really cool for me the writer and the game master as well because you're now like you have all this full lore and everything all set out instead of this you know i'm just kind of winging it in the moment kind of thing mm -hmm. not that there's anything wrong with winging it but apples and oranges yeah exactly yeah or uh, yeah, so you're right. First one, first one will yeah. probably be 240 to 300 pages. So, a lot of times, whenever whenever there's a grab a grab bag of adventures as a supplement for a game, um, there tends to be a focus on providing a variety of adventures and adventuring styles. With the four, is that something that you're aiming for? That each of them yeah, is going to have a different feel. Yeah, that's actually a really good question. I, I kind of hand so at first I had about eight or nine, and then I I uh, whittled it down to the four, possibly five, depends on the size of the book. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, But you're exactly right. I kind of went for theme and feel and type and sort of came down with four pillars, again, possibly five, that are kind of, you know, one is sort of like we just talked about, kind of Slavic Romanian, sort of almost Ravenloft feel to it. Mm -hmm. Takes place in the kingdom of Molovia. Um, there's my terrible Slavic accent. Uh, and, <laughs> and then there's another one that's on the other side of the world, on the Eastern continent, um, that harkens back to the sort of ancient Egyptian and Babylonian cultures there that are, or derived cultures that are in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's like a maritime one, more of a naval oriented one. Um, yeah. So basically, like you said, they kind of cover different aspects and atmospheres of the setting. If I end up running the maritime one, I'm putting in a rule that anybody who starts singing a shanty will have to suffer the pain glass. <laughs> as well, are as well they should. Well, I can't have them walk. I can't have them walk the plank. But are you familiar with the pain glass? I think I, I think I may have told you about that some time ago. I think you did the last interview, and I can't quite remember. Oh, just to just for a bit of catch up. The pain glass is something I do to discourage people from doing dumb things or from cheating in my, okay. in my games. It is a shot glass that is filled with water, salt, sea salt, pepper, black pepper, Tabasco sauce, Frank's Red Hot sauce, um, tiger sauce, and sriracha. <laughs> You're just missing the black powder. I got black pepper. So close you could enough. probably make black powder out of that concoction. Yeah, the whole the whole purpose of it is to is to cause pain. If they don't want to do that, I can make I the option B is drink a bottle of bacon soda, completely. <laughs> nice. So does that cut back on the puns and the shanties pretty pretty well? Um, I only do that because I've got three people who can't sing. <laughs> okay. One of one of whom keeps trying, even though his attempt to sing got us kicked out of a karaoke bar once. Oh, that's pretty rough because there's some bad karaoke. So if you get kicked out of a karaoke bar, that's yeah. Uh. Well, supposedly that was the reason why. I think it. I think it's because they they were afraid I was going to pull a jukebox bombing again. <laughs> Which is basically you find the worst song you can find out of jukebox and put five or ten dollars in it. <laughs> so that one song oh, right. goes on repeat for hours on end. Right, a proper jukeboxing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it could it could have gone it could have gone either way, and I ha- and the only t- the only time we the only time I haven't gotten myself in trouble with karaoke is um, worst Irish tenor contest where being bad is kind of the point. Right. I like shanties. I like. I like. Uh, I like. Fo- I. I like introducing folks. Folk songs. Um, but just because you're playing something bardic doesn't mean I expect you to sing. In fact, I would prefer you don't. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's a good point. Remember, your charisma. Your charisma is probably high, and you have, and you're skilled in performance. Let's not ruin it, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but with. But with that said, are, it sounds to me, based on how you describe it, that you're not setting the any of the encounters for a particular um, experience level, unless I'm mistaken on that front. Uh, no, not really. I feel like they're all pretty, as long as you're moderately knowledgeable of the game, especially Game Master-wise. I feel like as a player character, you don't really need to have any sort of... Uh, system mastery of Savage Kingdoms. And I did design the game to be pretty simple. I mean, you've, you've looked at it. Mm-hmm. Mechanically, it's pretty simple. It, it gets all the fidgets and bells and whistles when you start tweaking you know, character design and uh, because you can really kind of build whatever you want to. But but anyway, uh, long way of saying that I think it's a, it's a pretty easy game to kind of get into, especially if you're already used to something like D&D or something like that. Mm-hmm. So I'm not too worried. And honestly, you know, this is like this is like I've said this for years, but I feel like low experience players sometimes bring a better experience to the table because they're not a lot of us that have game for so long, we have these preconceived notions of how encounters are 
what we're supposed to do here game mechanically. And so I, I kind of almost like the new players because they almost come in uh, more, uh, in some ways, more in character because they don't really know all the little fidgets and buttons and all the game mechanics and stuff. Uh, you touched on something interesting with that that I've, co that I've covered in the past that I call Designed by Gospel. Um, mm. Designed by Gospel is my shorthand for when people are designing things, not because it makes sense for the kind of pro the kind of project that they're leaning into, but because but because those are designs that are expected. Mm, okay, um, right. One of the, if you don't mind, a video game example. One that one that I bring up is, and I did, I brought this up on the podcast, is. People um, expecting a more Metroidvania style with the with an entry in, in the Castlevania series. Um, oh yeah, because I started using this term right around the time there was all the debate with Lords of Shadow, and people arguing that it was too that it was too linear. And I had I had argued that it was very clear that Mercury Steam had far more interest in in um the er, the NES and Super NES days of Castlevania rather than the stuff that came afterwards they even directly cited Super Castlevania 4 hmm. so okay. good at, series by the way yeah i had i had felt that it was unfair to to make a com to compare um Lords of Shadow to a standard that it was not trying to meet anyways okay uh, designed by gospel. Yeah. Or designed by Transylvania. <laughs> now I've only seen the uh, animated movies. I've never played the games. So yeah. But the er the early ge the early games were were side scrollers. Um, just okay. level just full on level based side scrollers. Right. Okay. And that and they Mercury Steam wanted to lean into that. With the first Lords of Shadow, um, but it's I under it's one of those cases where ex where expectations can create problems, um, and I'm pre I'm pretty sure you've seen this as, you've seen this as well where cer where um, certain fo certain folk will co will um will come into will come into a game and have a Assumption of how it's going to work because it's a fantasy game, and right, then yeah. get a rude awakening. I've had to deal with that myself, and I'm pretty sure you have as well. Yeah, and that's kind of what I, as you alluded to, that's kind of what I based that that remark on. And you just kind of ran with it and made it further. That's actually a really good point. There's a lot of assumptions. Um, you know, oh, this is uh, we're set in uh, Conan's Hyborian age, so I need to play a sweaty, muscle-bound barbarian. So I, not necessarily, uh, you know. So uh, preconceived notions, or even encounter notions. Oh, it's the lava river. We have to jump over it, or you know. And there could be twelve other ways to deal with it, uh, because you know all these little, uh, those little uh, archetypes and stereotypes kind of get caught in our, our mind, and and that's fine for from a game designer point of view, I think. But sometimes at the table, it can be as much of a hindrance as it is a uh, a bonus. Sometimes I think. Um, I think that's why I, fi I find a bit of irony when so when somebody says that a gi that a given ubiquitous game I won't mention can run and can run virtually any fantasy. <laughs> Or that, yeah. or that you can, or the age-old line of, you can make, you can make any, you can make any character you want in this game, is what is the sales pitch. When in reality, there's in reality, people are going to stick to certain crutches. Um, yeah, I'm not, That's I'm not true. sure how much of how much of um, the Elder Scrolls you've played, but with say Skyrim, even though you could it's potentially make, yeah, even though you can just potentially Skyrim for me, sorry. Um, even though you can potentially make any kind of character, in reality, everybody ends up making some variation of a sneaky archer or an arcane archer. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, the architecture, the archetypes are still embedded in there somewhere. You're right. Just add flourishes on it, I suppose. Uh, Which is fine, you know. But it's fine. But don't don't write checks you can't cash. Right. Yeah. 
And that's a good point. Like the certain game you just mentioned, its strength is its ability to supposedly adapt all the different settings and themes and approaches. And that's true. But you know, I was watching a, a YouTuber the other day. I can't remember when some game designer that I follow, and he had some good points about it's really about the limitations that really make the game. Not in the fact that, oh, you can't do that, you can't, but limitations as in theme, thematic limitations. Uh, it would be like, you know, the first time I played Call of Cthulhu after playing Dungeons and Dragons back in the 80s to date myself, uh, and, and thinking that you're a broadsword-wielding adventurer in the Call of Cthulhu setting, it doesn't work that way. You need to be an investigator, and there's a lot of things to be really scared of, and magic is really dark, and... So I like the fact that it was a limitation that it was set upon us, which challenged us to think in a different way, you know, and come up with different approaches. Yeah, and you look at you look at some of the stuff that Sanderson has talked about regarding magic systems. So much of that is about limitations and working around them. Yeah, and in fact, that might he was one of the people I was watching with that. Um, there was a game designer as well, but you're right. I watched his last. Uh, uh, spiel about that mm -hmm. and uh, really good points and within with but I will note that when I mentioned ex, when I mentioned experience amount I was I was trying to dance around the the whole level thing because you don't because you don't use levels in the traditional sense with savage kingdoms yeah we have an advancement system which is similar but it's not quite as tied down to that. So, given that, given that, do you have plans to put asides in each of the adventures for how to run this at more at more adva at more advanced tiers of of parties? I guess I'll say. Yeah, that's actually a good question because I literally was kind of wrestling with that yesterday when I was writing on it. So I'm think I'm probably going to list like uh after the adventure title or the introduction somewhere on that opening page it'll probably say best fit for advancement levels two to four or whatever mm -hmm. uh and then maybe the typical savage kingdoms display uh disclaimer of it doesn't really matter as much about level in this system uh although you know it does to a little degree but in my experience i've had first advancement characters wander around with fifth and sixth and it's not a super big issue. Like, in other words, it's not as big an issue as it would be a certain ubiquitous D&D. &D, oh, sorry. Well, I just said it. A certain ancient role-playing game. And not to pick on it, actually, like D&D &D 5th Edition, honestly. I, I run it professionally for kids after school and stuff. But, but yeah, it's not as broad as a uh, disparity, level disparity. Mm -hmm. And so, so as, as I understand it, you've got... You've got one adventure that's leaning into gothic horror you've right. got you've got one adventure that's leaning into um the fer into a more fertile crescent style of play correct one adventure that's leaning into um more nautical stuff i'd imagine with either corsairs or pirates because everything's better with pirates <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a flavoring of that, but it's not directly that. But yeah, it, it can be. The party could go in that direction. Mm -hmm. That's three. So what would what would the theming be with the fourth one? Let's see. What did we cover? Okay, um, the one over in uh, R and ancient Zarkon on the continent of Hassan. So that's basically the east, the far east. That one would kind of be a traditional sword and sorcery sword and sandals kind of feel with dark sorcery involved thematically um, a, a possible awakening of an ancient evil so there's some horror elements in that one as well too mm -hmm. it seems to be a theme with me nowadays a lot of horror elements <laughs> uh, I, th I think it's I think it's very easy to when you're de when you're dealing with exploration um, in the in the relatively unknown it's very easy to lean into horror mm, right yeah it's a go-to you're right it's a because they're already in the unknown it's already dark they don't know much about it and you know the jump scares are kind of easy uh not always necessarily jump scares but well just think of, just think about how many how many um f how many fairy tales originate from from the crazy stuff that was deep in 
um, forests in uh, in yeah. say Europe. That's true. They were basically uh, folk tales to keep the kids from wandering off into the forest, mm-hmm. or don't go into the cave or whatever. Yeah. So good point, but and, which is probably why I like darker fairy tales. <laughs> and gro- I will. There's always a there's always a small part of me that lo- that um want that wants to be a fly on the wall when somebody who's mostly known the more disnified version of fairy tales ends up reading the original ones for the first time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Cinderella having to cut her toes off to make the glass slipper fit, etc. Yeah. Or um, mm-hmm. or the story of the re- the girl in the red shoes. Um, yeah. Right, which is related. Which is related. I um, I got in, I got in trouble I got in trouble years ago when um, I, when a fr- a dear friend of mine, and I'm surprised that I'm surprised that they're still my friend after what I did. Um, really liked the Hunchback of Notre Dame as as in the film. And so oh yeah, yeah. If you thought that was good, you should you should read the original book. And yeah. I t- I said nothing beyond that. They did, and they ended up staring daggers at me after they finished for like three yeah. days. Pretty dark. I'm actually doing that show uh, next month. We'll go into rehearsals for it, The yep. Hunchback of Notre Dame, mm-hmm. the big musical. But wow. I'm hoping some of the – I think a lot of the darkness is left in it, which is nice. Yeah. But – and that's just that's just one, that's just one exa- example of that kind of thing. And even gro- even growing up in the Midwest as as I did, I was already exposed to think to sto- to stories like when- to stories like Wendigos. And if I'm being honest, I found werewolves more scary than vampires as a kid. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Well, and you're you're in an area there's a lot of Germanic and Scandinavian lore mixed in with probably indigenous uh, tribal lore. Which we, you know, we have the Cherokee stuff where we are. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so you get the Wendigos and Skinwalkers and all that kind of crazy stuff, which well, is pretty cool. There's that, in the, there's that in the fact that, I'm, that I've been surrounded by forests my whole life. And, I've ha- and both myself and my old man have had our encounters with either wolves or wild dogs. Um, yeah, right, yeah. Here it's bears. Um, occasionally a wolf. Yeah, and I've, I've, I'm no strange. I'm no stranger to dealing with bears. Um, I understand why ev- why everyone in Canada is afraid of moose. <laughs> yeah, I think they're more dangerous than bears, honestly. <laughs> bears, you can at least predict. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, Especially black bears. You know, brown bears are a little more aggressive, but. Mm-hmm. I mean. Territorial and will do, and don't let them get any human food because they'll go out it because they'll go crazy to try and get it. Food aggression, yeah, exactly. They've been on our front porch here, and we just have to kind of mm-hmm. just kind of ignore them, and they'll go away. But <laughs> I mean, may, maybe if I maybe if I lived in Eastern Europe, I'd prob I'd probably be more scared. I'd probably be more scared of vampires as a kid. But right, yeah, makes sense. Plus, growing up in growing up in the '90s during that neo during that whole neo gothic phase. Um, yeah, White Wolf publishing and all that. Not not just not just White Wolf, but think but things like things like the Anne the Anne Rice books, the massive popularity of of um, Wesley Snipes' Blade. Mm, right. Yeah, um, that's true. Stuff, stuff like, stuff like, say, the Brood when it came to professional wrestling, um, or, mm. or a lot of a lot of the more or more urban fantasy leanings with vampires that you see that you saw in films a lot back then. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That's kind of where it really first started. Yeah. As far as the more uh, modernist, modern, modernistic approach of like urban fantasy with the vampires and stuff. And then they got all glittery, and now we're back to normal. I hope we're ba- we're back to no- we're back to normal because nope, nobody wants to deal with the glittery stuff again. Even the people who are involved with the glittery stuff. Um, <laughs> and I think everyone I think everyone's just had a gentleman's agreement to never think about doing that again. 
<laughs> Sorry. Now I, I I will applaud. Uh, what's her? What's the writer's name? The author Mayor. Stephanie. Yeah, I do applaud her different approach. I will say that. But but you're right. Now it's all right. It's done. Now it's time to seek a different avenue. Yeah. Uh, although there were there were a couple other entries that t that took different avenues that I found kind of interesting. One was this not very good film on on sci-fi, which treat which treated vamp called on um, perfect being, which treated vampires almost like um almost like priests. Like they were, mm. like they were, rep like they were given, they were given some sort of gift from God. Is that a is that a recent series or? It was it was a one off it was a one off film I saw a long time ago and while the film is definitely sci fi channel levels of bad it was interesting. Was it the Paul Bettany stuff? I, that actor he plays it. I can't remember like a priest, but he had some supernatural. I don't animal. think so. The actor that plays, uh, uh, what's his face from Marvel? Anyway, you probably know who I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't him. Jarvis, yeah. But given, but given that, but given that, because of the fact that so much of adventuring involves going out into the into the un, into the unknown or the or the unclaimed parts of of a of a given landscape. That naturally lends itself to horror because the most primal form of horror is fear of the unknown. Mm, right. Yeah. Uh, yep. It's kind of easy pickings, mm -hmm. but you know it usually works. So <laughs> that's why it's easy pickings, I guess. Well, that that and a lot of horror works very well when when you're in a place that you shouldn't be, or you're going into a place that you shouldn't. Yeah, I agree. And I think most of it being psychological or mental works better. Mm -hmm. There's a tendency with new films to kind of... Actually, you know, I think a lot of filmmaking is getting away from it. But we were in the gore era, which is fine if you like that thing. But to me, that's not scary. Scary is like not quite ever seeing what the creature is. And like you said, the darkness and the trees and or whatever it is, or mountains or whatever it is that's blocking what you can see. I just think that's a really cool way, and I, I I think that's a good adventure design approach as well to things. Oddly enough, um, when it comes to get, I find that I find that games can do, have a can do a much better job of establishing horror than film can, because you yeah. yourself are going into those places that you shouldn't. <laughs> Exactly, and uh, and uh, and to piggyback of what I just said, I think it's a, you're exactly right. It's the fact that since everybody is imagining it slightly different in their brain, that's I think that's where the terror is because you're going to naturally gravitate to probably what's the scariest thing. Well, um, you know, we describe the river there. I, you know, in real life, I have a horrible fear of deep water, and so now you're fixated on that, and that becomes scary, or whatever the case may be. A a video game series that I f I feel has. Man has managed to dip into horror adjacent, even though that isn't its primary goal. Oddly enough, is the Souls games. Um, mm, okay, and, um, that Dark makes sense. Um, you know, Dark, Dark Souls and the like. Yeah, right. Lush yeah, it's very horror themed, right? It's very Witcher type horror, I believe. Close. Never actually played it. I've watched people play it. That sounds really pathetic, With... but. <laughs> With Dark Soul, with the three Dark Souls game, with the three Dark Souls games, there is certainly that there is certainly that element. Um, Bloodborne, I'd say, is the most blatant, since that is leaning far more into gas lamp style horror with a he with a healthy amount of love of uh, Lovecraftian cosmic um, insanity. Oh, cool! Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You can do uh, if it's gaslight, right? You can do Jack the Ripper. And also a little bit of Lovecraftian stuff there. Yeah. Um, Sekiro, I'd say, I'd say is, I'd say is the le I'd say is the least in that regard. Um, more, of, it's more of a horror by implication, i.e., i.e., um, a the search for immortality and what and what being immortal really entails. 
Mm, okay, um, that's cool. Along with a few no nods to the manga Blade of the Immortal. Um, and mm. with El with Elden R with Elden Ring, I still I still need some more time to figure out what style of horror you could go you could go with that. If it, if mm, any okay. at, if any at all, because that's still that's still too new, and I've only done it. I've I haven't done enough run throughs of it. Yeah, I've yet to play it. I think I'm the only person on the planet. I, uh, I've you're not the first person to say that. Okay, <laughs> so I'm not the first person on the planet. But in fact, I've in fact I've had to warn people just because just because the game is making waves, don't jump into it and expect that you're going to be um, ha having an easy time because it's still a Souls game and you are still going to get your face kicked in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll have to definitely have to check that one out for sure. At the very, at the very least, you can, at the very least, you can joke about George R. R. Martin actually finishing something <laughs> yeah. because he's not going to finish Winds of Winter. Winds of Winter, yeah. Oh, I mean, the show finished it, but you know, you know how well that went. Well, that was because Dan, Dan and Dave were trying to get it out of the way so that they could work on a Star Wars project, which. Never, which never really. happened. <laughs> so, turns out they got it out of the way for nothing. Yeah, that's wh that's why you never go all in at the poker table. Yeah, right, exactly. You just don't know what's gonna follow. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, I'm guess because of the fact that you're dealing with these different subgenres within the book. I'm guessing that there's going to be some GM advice on how to how to get how to nail that theme. Yeah, I think in uh, each adventure uh, at the at the the forward area of the adventure, I'll probably have GM game mastering notes, or maybe I'll include it at the end. I haven't really decided exactly where that will fall in, but yeah, I'll have some of that uh, at least a page or two of coaching. You know how to approach. Or certain techniques, you know, adjectives to use and pacing, you know, all that typical storytelling stuff. Pro probably a primer about about each particular area and where it takes place. Yeah, yeah, a little geographical uh, primer. There'll there'll be a map or two mm -hmm. as well. I know a lot of my books have been kind of art light for the most part, and that's mostly because we haven't really had the budget to hire a bunch of artists. Mm -hmm. But hopefully. Um, the maps will, or is a little bit easier to produce. Yeah. Now you're sh you are shooting for around 240 pages, as as I recall. If if a fifth adventure gets added to that, would you would that end up expanding the page count to to something like 280, or not the case? Uh, probably would expand it a little bit. I, I'm kind of leaving it open to to editing, but. Now that I'm doing the math in my head, if it's, fifth, say, 50 pages per adventure, that's 200 and 400 uh, for a bestiary chapter. Um, so, yeah, you're to, to answer your question, to, if it ends up being five adventures, you're right, it'd probably be 280 to 300, which is fine. And the Savage East, the last book, was uh, 320, I think, which is a pretty decent size without being too ridiculous, I think. I kind of got away from that model back in Reforge, which was the second edition. I combined the Savage East and the Core Rulebook into one tome, and it was, some people liked it, but it was 550 pages or whatever. And for perfect bound, binding, just in a complete physical capacity, it was just kind of I feel unwieldy. Bad. I feel yeah. bad for whoever had to carry that carry that book at the table. Yeah, me and most. <laughs> Carry around convention, yeah, so that's you, actually what you do. You do a fair amount of physical training as it is, so you're fine. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm getting getting a little older now. But yeah, so I was like, all right, let's let's um let's just separate the two books again for third edition. Mm -hmm. But it ends up the core rulebook ended up being pretty thick anyway. So. But I, I probably did shorten it by eight, eighty to one hundred pages, so that was nice. Now. What would you be shooting for as far as a release window for Heroic Adventures? Uh, so the fulfillment for the for the crowdfunding for the Kickstarter is September. 
and then it would be released to drive through RPG and hopefully Amazon maybe probably end of September, early October. So I'm, I'm allowing myself a little more time on this and a lot of the, my past projects were pretty immediate because I already had 80% of it written. This one I only have about 15 to 20% written so I had to kind of allow myself a little more time. And I've got some other stuff. I've got some showbiz, some you know acting gigs and some other stuff that's coming up that's kind of demanding my extra time so i decided this time i'm just gonna pace it out and uh mm-hmm. you know try to just take two or three months to get it done which makes sense oh uh, and i'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops but yeah please uh yeah but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Thanks, Milter. Yeah, thanks for having me again. And uh, if I can just shout out really quick for everybody to check it out on Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. Uh, Savage Kingdom's Heroic Adventures. Yep. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to, to, whether it's to discuss j- just, um, just horror in general, I really should have done this interview on the 13th, but oh well. <laughs> or, <laughs> right. or, um, or, ju- or just how the how the most horrible thing are in role playing games are all is and always will be the dice gods. <laughs> the <laughs> door is always open. As I often say around here, Thanks, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Much appreciated. And, of course, a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!